Hello folks, it's good to see you again. I have a confession to make. I was going to make a follow-up to my previous video, in which I showed you how to capture and store energy from a portable solar charger more efficiently, and I had already written most of the script for that video and even done some recordings. I was going to show you how to improve the setup, which I nicknamed the Solar Rechargeable Power Bank, and then I found out that somebody has beaten me to it. Well, not to making a video about that, but to actually designing a much improved solar rechargeable power bank. Specifically, it's the people at Waveshare. Remember them? They are the makers of the original solar power manager, which was at the core of my previous project. There were a few things which I wanted to improve about that, and the new solar power manager B ticks all those boxes. So, that's what this video will be about. I have the Solar Power Manager B right here, but before I start talking about it, I want to give you just a quick recap of my previous video. I got myself a portable solar charger, which is designed to charge your portable electronic devices when you're outdoors. Specifically, I got an Anchor Power Port 21 Watt, which I rid of the electronics box with the USB ports and instead connected it up to the original Solar Power Manager. I also mated this setup with a rechargeable lithium-ion battery, which could store some surplus energy from the solar panels for later use. The setup worked, and compared to a stock power port connected to a normal power bank, it did capture solar energy about three times as efficiently in variable sunlight such as would be experienced during a backpacking trip. But as I said at the end of my previous video, there were some things about this setup which could still be improved. I mentioned two points in my previous video. First, the rate of charge at which the lithium-ion battery could be charged. The original solar power manager had this rate set to just over 1 amp, or around 4 watts. If you recall, the anchor power port can deliver up to 21 watts of power, which means that in the most favorable conditions, around 80% of the available power is not used. And the second point is the power output, which determines the speed at which electronic devices, such as your smartphone, can be charged. In theory, the solar power manager can deliver up to 5 watts of power, which is already quite slow, but for reasons I will explain in a moment, many devices will only charge at 2.5 watts, which is really slow. For comparison, the fast charger which came with my Samsung Galaxy S20 can whack out up to 25 watts. Yep. It's 10 times as fast. The charge rate, given in amps, determines how fast the lithium-ion battery can be charged, which ultimately translates into the amount of energy available to charge your smartphone. This is the bottleneck. If you want to be able to charge the lithium-ion cell quickly, you need a high enough charge rate. In my previous video, the charge rate for the lithium-ion battery was set to 1.09 amps, which works out to around 4 watts. That's fine for low-power Internet of Things applications, but for charging something like a smartphone, it's quite meager. Someone in the comments of my previous video asked me why I carry around a 21-watt solar panel when only about 4 watts can be used. And it is true, just one of the three folding panels could still produce more power than can be used, at least in full sunlight, although the extra panels do help in partial sunlight. The charge rate is determined by the lithium-ion battery charger, so there is only one way to increase it. You need a more powerful charger. We've gotten used to being able to take our phones from 10% charge to 60% in less than half an hour. That's fast, but it does require a charger to support that speed. As I said before, the original solar power manager can only put out up to 5 watts, which isn't very fast to begin with, but in reality, many devices will only charge at 2.5 watts, which is so slow, it would take my Samsung Galaxy S20 almost 7 hours to charge from flat to full. So, how can the power output be increased? The answer to that question is a bit complicated, but bear with me, I'll try to keep it brief. First, a little history lesson. Remember the original USB connector from the 90s? It was capable of delivering 0.5 amps at 5 volts, 
or 2.5 watts. And this was fine for early USB devices, but when smartphones came along and kept getting more and more powerful, their batteries also kept fattening up, and eventually 2.5 watts was simply not enough power to charge up these smartphones in any reasonable amount of time. So to get around this issue, manufacturers started introducing faster high power charging systems which allowed a phone and charger to negotiate power levels much greater than 2.5 watts. But the exact means of how this power negotiation took place kept changing over time and unfortunately they were often incompatible with each other. Thankfully, the USB-C standard is now putting an end to this proliferation by providing a uniform and highly flexible means of negotiating power levels. As of May 2021, the USB-C PD, or Power Delivery Standard, supports power levels of up to 240 watts, almost 100 times that of the very first USB standard. When you plug in your smartphone to its charger, charging doesn't begin immediately. The two have a little chat first, in which the charger advertises the various power profiles it supports, the phone selects the one it likes best, the charger activates that profile, and then charging begins. That is power negotiation. The reason many devices will charge from the original solar power manager at only 2.5 watts is that it supports no power negotiation at all, and as a result, Many devices will simply fall back to a safe charging level of, you guessed it, 2.5 watts, just as in the earliest days of USB. To take advantage of high power charging, two things are required. A strong enough power supply and some electronics which support the USB-C power delivery standard. There is a good chance you already use both every day without realizing it, because USB-C PD isn't just used for smartphones anymore, but also for tablets, for laptops and much else. So now that I've told you what can be improved about the setup from my previous video, let me introduce you to the device which does all of that. The WaveShare Solar Power Manager B. Unlike its predecessor, it's ready to go out of the box. It comes with a 10,000 mAh battery already installed, so there is no need to get your own, like in my previous video. At first glance, it may look much like another run-of-the-mill power bank, but look closer. It has a solar input, just like the previous solar power manager, except that this one can charge the lithium-ion battery at up to 2.4 amps, which is an increase of 120%. So now up to 10 watts of power, or around 50% of the output from the anchor power port can be used, instead of just 20%. Just like on the previous model, there is a USB-A socket, but there is also a USB-C port, which supports power delivery at up to 18 watts. That's not quite as fast as many fast charges, but hey, it just means that your phone will charge from flat to full in an hour and a half, instead of one hour. To use the anchor power port together with the Solar Power Manager B, they obviously need to be connected together. The Solar Power Manager B comes with an adapter which is just perfect for that. It plugs into the barrel jack and provides a screw terminal for the solar input. In my previous video I added an extra connector in between the two, but this isn't necessary with the Solar Power Manager B. Just extend the leads from the anchor power port and connect the right lead to the right screw terminal. To find out how to get access to the solar output of the Anchor Power Pod, check out my previous video. I'll put a link to the specific section in the description below. Just as before, the solar input needs to be set to the correct voltage, and to do that, the solar power manager needs to be taken apart. But don't worry, that's quite straightforward. For safety reasons, make sure the switch is set to off and undo all eight Phillips head screws on either face of the enclosure and lift off the top half. This reveals the large blue lithium-ion battery and the circuit board. Both can be slid out, and on the back of the circuit board you'll find an array of small switches. These are covered in a layer of captain tape, just get rid of that, and move the switch marked 18V to off and the switch marked 6V to on. Now reassemble the solar power manager and it's ready to be used with the anchor power port. But wait! Hold on that, because there is something else I need to tell you about the Solar Power Manager B. 
The Solar Power Manager B certainly improves on its predecessor, but it does have some issues of its own. The first one is the connector on the solar power input. I'm not a huge fan of barrel jacks because in my experience they have an unfortunate tendency to develop loose connections over time. And because they don't lock mechanically, there is a risk of accidentally yanking out the plug and if that happens without you noticing it, you could very well lose an entire day's worth of solar power. So if you do take it with you on a backpacking trip, make sure you don't inadvertently tug at the solar power lead. The second issue is weight. All told, the Solar Power Manager B weighs in at 280 grams or just under 10 ounces and that's not insignificant for a long backpacking trip where every gram counts. And the third issue is heat. The electronic components responsible for the solar charging get quite hot when the solar panels deliver full power. A transistor, a diode and an inductor on the board get particularly hot. These components form a so-called buck converter, which has the purpose of converting the voltage from the solar panels, which is around 6 volts, to the voltage of the lithium-ion battery, which can be anywhere from 2.8 to 4.2 volts. Because any energy conversion processes involve inefficiencies, which manifest themselves as waste heat, these components get hot. They are also mounted quite close to the edge of the circuit board, where the leads from the battery run, so there is a risk of the battery leads getting hot as well. To mitigate that, I recommend that you fix the leads to the battery itself using some Captain Tape. That's Captain with a K. I recommend Captain Tape because it is a very heat resistant material, which is, among other things, used in aircraft and spacecraft, but also for 3D printers. So, if like most people, you don't have Captain Tape at home, you can ask someone who has a 3D printer if he can scrounge a little tape. Alternatively, Captain Tape is readily and inexpensively available on eBay. Try to get hold of some tape 10mm or 3 8 of an inch wide. First, carefully disconnect the 4-pin connector of the battery from the circuit board. Then, use a few strips of Captain Tape running from top to bottom over the face of the battery to fix the cables in place. Make sure they run along the top edge of the battery so they stay away from the circuit board. You can now reconnect the battery, insert it back in the case, reassemble everything and you're all set. As I did with the original Solar Power Manager, I took this one on a few hiking trips to see how much energy it would capture in the real world. The expectation is that, with a little direct sunlight and lots of shading by trees or clouds, say, there should be no significant difference in the performance of these two, because the constraining factor is the power output from the solar panels, and not the charge rate of either solar power manager. However, with ample sunlight and limited shading, this solar power manager should deliver vastly superior performance. And sure enough, the results of two hiking trips I took in early 2022 confirmed this. The weather was sunny and beautiful on both days, but on the first trip the solar panels were shaded most of the time, either by trees or because I descended a mountain on the north slope. Consequently, the performance was pretty much the same as the average for the original solar power manager. At that rate of energy capture, it would have taken about 14 hours to capture enough energy for a full charge of my Samsung Galaxy S20. On the second trip, however, the solar panels received full sunshine most of the time and as a result, the rate of energy capture was 135% better than the original solar power manager. At this rate, you could capture enough energy to charge up two smartphones from flat to full in one day. The successor to the original Solar Power Manager provides a significant improvement in power, both on the solar input and the USB output side. But perhaps most importantly, it comes pre-assembled with a nice case, so there is no need for tinkering or soldering, as in my previous video. By the way, this is a prototype of my own version of the improved solar rechargeable power bank. As you can see, building it would have required a fair amount of handicraft work, and of course it's so much easier to buy something ready-made than building it yourself. 
Anyway, that's it for my second video. Thoughts, comments and suggestions are appreciated. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and yada yada. We all know the drill by now, don't we? And thanks for watching.